Alrighty, I think we can start. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Rashad. I'm representing Terco Health Hub. Um, I'm happy to have a next event from Health Talk series. Uh, we've been organizing these events for several years now, around three, four, I think. And these days we're doing it with all sorts of, all the hubs in Finland, health hubs specifically. And um, these events focus on health and life sciences. We record all of our events and upload them on YouTube so you can watch them later as well if you've missed them. Uh, so our, our celebrities are gonna, our speakers are gonna become celebrities. So, um, and today's event is in collaboration with the GAR Foundation. Uh, I won't speak too much of uh, our organization. Terco is a startup hub focusing on health and life sciences. We have co-working spaces and events and programs and services. You can check about them on our website. So I'll give the floor um, to Marcelo, but before that, I'd like to have you watch a video on what the GAR Foundation is. Did you know there's a silent pandemic on a global scale called antibiotics resistance and antimicrobial resistance? Did you know that every year about 700,000 people die from a drug resistant infection? And that at least 2.8 million people get an antibiotic resistant infection? COVID-19 has taught us that pandemic preparedness requires a global, coordinated effort. If no action is taken, AMR could cause 10 million deaths every year by 2050. The damage to our economy would be dramatic and forces millions of people into poverty. Simple medical procedures and operations would even become dangerous. Common infections would become untreatable. We can still change the course of this terrible perspective. There are a few things that can be done. We need to re-educate how and when to use antibiotics and when not. This is crucial for doctors, nurses and patients. We need better surveillance of resistant infections and to test to identify resistance. Animals should receive antibiotics only when needed and no precautionary antibiotics. As this has a huge effect on our food chain and our antibiotics resistance, governments need to be informed and involved so that they can start to promote innovation and development of new antibiotics. The development of antibiotics has almost stopped. For many years now, the funding has been too low for most pharmaceutical companies to do any extensive research and development. Mainstream media should be informed about the present situation to create a global awareness. The goal of the GAR Foundation is to raise awareness, especially among politicians, medical staff and journalists, to inform and educate, provide articles from experts on the field and events, so that they can promote actions, develop a coordinated and equitable approach to pandemic preparedness and global health security. It's not too late. But we need to act now and work together. In order to hand over a safer and healthier world to our children and the next generations. We simply cannot look the other way. Delay is not an option. We need to act now. Alrighty, so Marcelo, pre please. Thank you, Rashad, for your great introduction. 
Um, and thank you everybody to be here present live, but also for the enormous um, interest uh, in the internet. Well, to introduce myself, I'm Marcello Verossen, and I'm representative of the Global Antibiotic Resistance Foundation, in short, the GAR Foundation. And what do we stand for? Is the left or the right? Okay. After one of our beloved, uh, after one of our beloved uh, died, once died, from an antibiotic resistant infection, we decided that something has to be done to avoid this terrible situation and to help fighting the de against the development of antibiotic resistance and to reduce the misuse of antibiotics. Our foundation is in the front of creating awareness and education about AMR and antibiotic stewardship. We do that on different platforms and with different partners. We organize, organize events and started to create a patient platform. And you can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Telegram, our website, and soon Reddit to promote our work and education. The GAR Foundation is uh, very pleased to work together with Terco and others on this important subject, AMR. We are also very happy to be invited to join the prestigious Finnish consortium EPATH, which is the flagship on emerging pathogens, including infectious diseases and AMR. With all research excellence from all the involved university life science faculties, together with collaborators like Finnish Food Authority, Institute for Health and Welfare, Defense Forces, Hoos Hospital, and many more. So now about the subject of the event. How could we use artificial intelligence in our battle against AMR? I just want to give you some examples, not too extensive. Uh, we could, for example, use artificial intelligence for some uh, things like finding common, common materials, uh, discovering of complete new antibiotics, and many other things, but uh, some of our speakers are going to uh, tackle those subjects. So now it's time to introduce the first speaker. Um, and I'm proud to announce um, a well-known specialist in the field of AMR. It's Mr. Manuel Freira Carabral, who is a professor of pharmacology uh, of one of the oldest universities in Europe, uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And it opened her doors already in the year 1495. And Manuel is going to describe the definition of AMR and explain a general approach on AMR and the existing situation. Welcome, and the stage is yours, Manuel. Thank you, Marcelo. I will just very quickly stop sharing my slides so that Manuel can start. Uh, sorry for the delay in the starting. I want to, to thank uh, uh, the Global uh, Antibiotic Resistance uh, Foundation, uh, especially uh, my friend Marcelo, uh, for inviting me to participate uh, in this session, very interesting session. And I also uh, want to thank uh, all uh, the organizations involved in it, including Teco Health Hub. Well, I am a professor of pharmacology of the School of Medicine in Santiago, and my uh, field of interest is the discovery of new compounds useful uh, for cancer purposes and also for infection. Um, my, uh, the aim of my presentation here is uh, to give a general view about uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the videotape you have projected before uh, gives a good answer to uh, all the questions that anybody can have about that. But I will try to explain some uh, additional data about it. Well, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, is the ability of microbes to defeat uh, the medicines designed uh, to kill uh, them. And uh, in these cases, they multiply and grow uh, at uh, concentrations that presumably should be fatal for, for uh, germs 
of uh, this, uh, different strains by the same species. Um, it affects uh, um, parasites, fungi, viruses, but especially known uh, the field of uh, antibiotic resistance. And I will try to focus a bit about that. It has uh, big consequences because uh, it will make uh, uh, more difficult the treatment of the diseases caused by these germs, and sometimes uh, it's really impossible, causing uh, more severe and uh, prolonged uh, illnesses, increasing uh, morbidity and mortality, and uh, in some cases, infection relapse. All this uh, may put into risk the success of modern medicine, and uh, boost uh, healthcare costs ju just uh, because it increases um, hospitalization and uh, the use of uh, complicated and uh, sophisticated um, diagnostic methods and treatment methods. Uh, another concept that's linked to an antibiotic resistance is um, antibiotic tolerance. Now it's uh, uh, in fashion because uh, uh, we are uh, discovering that uh, germs uh, survive uh, in some prosthetic uh, elements, uh, including cutters, forming uh, biofilms uh, where this uh, bacteria uh, survive uh, even being uh, fully susceptible uh, to these antibiotics uh, in tests. And uh, this bacteria can lead to a rapid evolution to antibiotic resistance. Uh, how antimicrobial resistance uh, happens? Well, that is uh, something inherent uh, to antimicrobial therapy and uh, sure to antimicrobial compounds uh, found in nature affecting uh, microbes uh, from uh, thousands of years or millions of years before. Antibiotic uh, or antimicrobial resistance is a consequence of evolution uh, through a natural uh, selection that let uh, microbes uh, uh, survive. How antibiotics uh, fight against bacteria? There are different mechanisms. Uh, one of them is uh, attacking uh, one structure that is, uh, appears in, in the microbes, in the bacteria, but not in the host cells, that is cell wall construction. Um, penicillins, for example, are at, uh, trying to, to avoid the construction of this cell wall. Also cell membranes, uh, protein synthesis, uh, DNA, or the incorporation or the use of some metabolites that bacteria need to, to be alive and to grow. And how uh, bacteria fight against antibiotics? But uh, in some cases, uh, they produce uh, enzymes that destroy uh, the antibiotic, as the case of metalactamase that uh, destroy uh, penicillins and uh, similar antibiotics. Also, uh, decreasing the influx of antibiotics inside uh, the bacteria. In other cases, uh, bacteria develops an uh, active flux, uh, uh, trying to send out uh, the antibiotic that has entered. Also, uh, bacteria uh, modifies uh, the targets that antibiotics uh, employ to kill the bacteria, just uh, um, um, covering or, or avoiding that the antibiotic acts over um, target proteins, uh, creating target proteins, or well modifying the site of modification. And uh, more complicated even, um, bacteria uh, generates new proteins with similar capacity as the antibiotic target one. And how it develops? Uh, well, um, in some cases, it's uh, uh, due to intrinsic material mechanisms, uh, mainly biochemicals, but also uh, genetics, uh, and uh, especially genetics. And uh, in some cases, we had to look for another explanation to the classical mechanisms, and in that epigenetics is being one of the factors uh, being uh, taken into account for explaining uh, resistance. But Obviously, antibiotic resistant genes let uh, the bacteria continue uh, in providing uh, uh, strains with resistance. What happens really? Well, when you have an inoculum in a patient uh, with lots of bacteria, some cases uh, there are some few number of uh, resistant ones, 
when the antibiotic uh, acts, uh, kills uh, the bad bacteria, but also uh, good bacteria that is useful uh, to protect the host against the bad bacteria. But resistant bacteria stays alive and uh, they grow and take over the situation uh, that's called uh, the vertical transfer of resistance. And even uh, this bad bacteria can't uh, transfer uh, these resistant uh, genes to non-resistant bacteria, making of them resistant bacteria. This uh, transfer of resistance from bacteria to bacteria uh, takes place uh, for different uh, methods or ways, like transduction, in which uh, phages, uh, bacteriophages, that are viruses, that uh, infect uh, um, resistant uh, uh, bacteria, um, take and uh, move uh, transfer to non-resistant bacteria. Also conjugation uh, from bacteria to bacteria. And finally, transformation is when the, the bacteria is broken. Some uh, transposomes enter non-resistant bacteria and transfer them the resistance to uh, the antibiotic. Which behaviors facilitate uh, antibiot antimicrobial resistance? Uh, one of them, uh, one of the most important is the misuse on overuse of antimicrobials but also the use of antimicrobials in livestock and fish farming. Uh, the poor infection control in hospitals and clinics and the lack of hygiene and poor sanitation of uh, environment, uh, houses and people. Some ecological factors are really important uh, and been discovered in, in, in the last times. Uh, the new... Uh, uh, approach to health is being one health in which, in which uh, human health, animal health, and environmental health are related and uh, not independent to each other. For instance, uh, we can find uh, antibiotic concentrations in selected aquatic environments, uh, in the sea, in the rivers, but especially in the treated and in, and untreated municipal sewage and treated hospital effluents and industrially polluted surface water, in which you can find the concentrations of antibiotics over the minimal uh, inhibitory concentrations, the, the concentrations in which bacteria are inhibited in the uh, growth. But also, we can find uh, resistant germs in the environment. This is a, a picture in which you can, you can see uh, people uh, playing with horses in the water, this water can be infected by humans and uh, animals. And uh, in, this, in this liquid environment, humans uh, can also uh, contaminate to each other and uh, animals do the same. And uh, animals can contaminate uh, also people. Uh, new resistance mechanisms are emerging and spreading uh, globally. Uh, now we are talking about a very uh, a aggressive multidrug resistant bacteria and pandrug resistant bacteria. There is a name, uh, Superbugs, uh, trying to show this kind of, of uh, really dangerous uh, um, uh, germs. Some of them have been listed by the WHO as those uh, using the acronym ESCAPE, uh, to which uh, new chemotherapeuticals are desperately uh, needed. Um, these uh, germs are uh, one of the most important, uh, relevant uh, uh, producers of uh, uh, consequences in human health. And uh, close to 5 million uh, deaths are associated with these bacterial antibiotic resistant uh, microbes uh, in uh, 2019 uh, worldwide. Some uh, infections that were uh, considered uh, warned in the past have now revival, and uh, nowadays uh, tuberculosis, resistant tuberculosis, both multidrug and extensive drug resistant tuberculosis are becoming a new uh, health uh, um, threat uh, that has been uh, to be managed uh, to avoid its big consequences on the human uh, health. Uh, by 2050, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, can uh, cause about uh, 10 million deaths a year. 
we are uh, cancer nowadays represents 8.2 uh, million deaths. So um, WHO has considered antimicrobial resistance one of the 10 public health threats facing humanity and promotes a global call to action in which uh, TGR has a role uh, to help. Some of the initiatives uh, are just uh, to um, promote uh, good behaviors that include the prevention of uh, new infections to avoid the spread of anti antimicrobial uh, resistant uh, organisms, the rational use of uh, antimicrobials, just uh, using the um, single advices like uh, to say to people that flu is not a bacterial disease that does not need antibiotics, and that broad spectrum antibiotics in many cases are not necessary. The south of Europe uh, has uh, bigger rates of antimicrobial resistance because in the past we uh, used too many uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. To complete antibiotic treatments, and to develop new antimicrobials, antimicrobial adjuvants, trying to fight against antibacterial uh, uh, um, mechanisms against antibiotics. To use uh, new treatments like fake antibiotic combinations, that's the use of fakes, uh, to help antibiotics to resist. And uh, faster antimicrobial susceptibility testing and antimicrobial uh, resistant detection, um, improving uh, the classic methods of uh, digs of antibiotics put in a bacterial uh, uh, culture, showing that uh, there are not rings around uh, this uh, disc when the bacteria were not sensible. Um, we have uh, different patterns uh, showing that uh, there is an inhibitory concentration of bacterial concentration of antibiotics. But now the diagnostic methods are much more complicated and use technology and uh, multiomics, integration of multiomics to facilitate things and make them faster and more precise. Metagenomics uh, is uh, open a new uh, um, way of fighting against antimicrobial resistance. Um, using uh, untargeted sequencing of herd communities in bulk samples we can know uh, pathogens appearing in these bulk uh, uh, samples and discovering using a metagenomic workflow those that are resistant against uh, the uh, chemotherapeuticals uh, agents. And uh, artificial intelligence is also uh, a future tool, of course. I uh, don't want uh, uh, to break over the present, into the presentations of my colleagues uh, that are much more experts on this matter. But let me just uh, have a brief note, note about that. Machine learning, that is a subset of artificial intelligence, uh, let us identify a complex patterns in real world data sets uh, that are not accessible for the human eye. And uh, this will open uh, a new strategies in the diagnostics of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Also, uh, in the prediction of antimicrobial resistance from gene sequences, to integrate metagenomics and artificial intelligence in clinical process and the discovery of, of new compounds. Uh, of course, uh, uh, some barriers, economical, privacy, um, patients' confidence are hindering the integration of artificial intelligence into clinical practice. But the uh, future will not stop us, and uh, artificial intelligence will be sure a part of our healthcare activity. So uh, I want to, to thank this initiative uh, uh, we are, I am participating now uh, because uh, it will uh, help in this way. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes, uh, there was a question in the chat. Do you think you could answer either or? Uh, yes, uh, um, the question is, what is the ratio between nosocomial infections as a result of poor hygiene standards or lack of monitoring and the bacterial flora of a patient with uh, a lower immune system response? 
Well, I have noticed uh, this data because it, 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 uh, it's a question for experts on public health. But uh, I, I am sure that uh, it should uh, uh, have a, 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 a immunosuppression uh, uh, will increase uh, the ratio of, uh, of uh, this flora and, uh, of course, uh, the ratio of uh, uh, proportionate ratio in the resistant uh, microbes. Um, because uh, uh, they will, uh, the defense against uh, microbes depends on the immune system, depends on the on the chemicals we use. When the immune system is not so 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 hard, um, uh, antibiotic resistance will increase. Of course, it's something that's also happening, for instance, in in, in cancer treatment. And you need the, the help of the immune system to to avoid. Uh, appearance of uh, resistant uh, uh, cancer cells to the uh, chemotherapies we use in, in, in the treatment. Okay, and there was a second question as well. Uh, yeah, I would say it. How can you elaborate on the data from the DNA sequence? I don't know if you guys can read it, but... Maybe I can read it out loud for you. So the question is, how can we elaborate the data from DNA sequence and AI? Uh, it's possible that this combination will reveal the fast analysis because after DNA sequencing, usually we should have some time and a lot of effort to do downstream analysis. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, well, uh, of course, uh, DNA sequencing is uh, faster and faster with time because equipments are much better. But we don't not only need to make uh, a, a genetic star, a studies, we can uh, use uh, omics tools. For instance, uh, transcriptomics uh, is being a very fast uh, tool uh, to discover uh, what is happening uh, in genetic background. Uh, and uh, phenomics is also another uh, good way to, to study uh, the behaviors of, of bacteria that are affecting a community or just a patient. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, we still don't have Susanna, and um, I think I'll just give the floor to Nikhil. <laughs> are you ready? Uh, thank you, Manuel. Uh, if you could also still still stick around, I'm, I hope we'll still have more questions. And thank you for the from the audience for the questions. Um, it is, so, mm -hmm. where do they start? Do you remember where it starts? The first one, this one. There you go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. I'm just getting set up with the presentation. Just a second. Okay, while the presentation is getting set up, I'll quickly do an, int uh, do an introduction. So, hi, all. Uh, my name is Nikhil Banerjee, and uh, I am the founder of uh, Innate AI, which is a, a social intelligence platform designed specifically for the healthcare sector. Um, Innate can, the Innate platform can essentially browse the internet for conversations happening regarding certain um, specific topics such as AMR and generate insight reports that can be used to get a better understanding of behavior and opinion within the healthcare professional and patient community. Um, we've, we're collaborating with the, with the, uh, the GAR Foundation um, and the, in this presentation, we'll explore how AI and social media can be used to promote public health. So, well, so of course, then this fits in the context of the, the GAR Foundation's F, you know, 
uh, efforts to spread awareness for their cause and influence positive health behavior regarding antibiotic use. Um, so let's start by answering a question, why social media? What makes social media an attractive data set to mine insights from and leverage for communication? Um, so the first reason is wide, a wide reach and accessibility. So social media platforms have billions of users um, worldwide, making them highly accessible to a diverse range of individuals. Uh, with easier and ch cheaper access to tech technology, social media is being adopted at a rapid rate across the globe. Um, averaging 227 million new users per year. It, yeah, it contains a, a diverse population sample. People from different backgrounds, regions, age groups use social media. Uh, providing a broad and varied pool of perspectives exp and experiences related to healthcare. And this can lead to higher levels of objectivity. It's, you, it's unbiased. It can also remove biases that traditional methods of assembling these uh, focus groups, uh, assembling focus groups might fall prey to. And, uh, you know, there might be a reason for the fact that there's physical separation and, and certain dis disinhibition in virtual environments. People can be further more motivated to talk openly um, as they find emotional support and a sense of belonging um, in online support groups. And finally, it's real time. Uh, social media offers a real time, uh, you know, real time information and updates on various healthcare topics. Um, users can share their experiences, discuss ongoing research, and report emerging health trends, um, and providing a dynamic and up to date uh, view of healthcare insights. I've, I've mentioned a few uh, public uh, social media networks that we're all aware of, and there's more specific healthcare healthcare-specific um, uh, social networks that patients, doctors, et cetera, use. And these are usually ca categorized across different therapeutic areas and topics. So um, coming back to the, the point of the, the presentation, so how can we use AI uh, to promote public health initiatives such as the one that, that, that the GAR Foundation is involved in? Um, to explain this, let's sort of explore, let's start with exploring an example study of how social media was used to promote uh, cervical cancer prevention. Uh, so the study was started in 2016 in the US um, and used AI and social media effectively uh, to understand the factors driving uh, the spread of information regarding cervical cancer prevention. Um, now, despite being a highly preventable um, and treatable disease, cervical cancer continues to cause significant mortality in young to middle-aged women. Cervical cancer is preventable with the HPV vaccine, and early detection of cervical cancer through pap testing can be an effective prevention strategy. At the time of the study, HPV vaccine vaccination rates in the US were suboptimal, and um, only Sixty uh, percent of teens aged 13 to 17 uh, were were initi initiating the vaccine, and only 43 percent were were completing the vaccine. Now, since social media is used extensively by young women, uh, it served to be a rich pool of information for the study. Um, by using a, a, a mixed approach of combining AI and qualitative. Um, analysis, uh, the discussions on Twitter were analyzed in terms of the content and type of accounts. And of course, the objectives of the study were to promote um, cervical cancer preven prevention messages over social media and, and, and hereby increase HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screenings. Now, it's quite interesting what, the, what we found, what the researchers found uh, through the analysis that they did. So they analyzed, uh, analyzed two types of information. So what was the kind of the message content uh, that was being spread more, uh, more frequently uh, and had a larger reach? And also, the you know, what were the types of account, the account type that was leading to uh, a higher spread of, of, of message uh, for, for the positive health behavior that we, we wanted to induce in the population? Um, and the findings suggested that contrary to anecdotal and observational evidence, uh, that individual messages about personal experiences were less likely to be effective, uh, whereas organizational social media accounts were more effective. 
Um, and the findings reinforced the importance of public trust in organizations rather than uh, individuals to share cancer prevention messages. Uh, the, so the key strategy that was developed as a result of this of this initiative was to boost the credibility of organizational accounts and to develop messages that directly convey new uh, and, and, and uh, develop messages that directly convey new factual information and resources through these organizational accounts. I'm going to caveat this by saying that there is a certain variability to this finding. Um, another study discovered that while in the US, so this study was based in the US, um, another study discovered that while in the US, more people are more likely to trust in certified healthcare providers and organizations. In Korea and Hong Kong, however, uh, there is a tendency to trust first-hand experience-based knowledge. Um, so there's a there's a there's a need to sort of localize all the research and insight findings, and this is where AI can be an incredibly powerful tool. So the role, so how is AI used to scale social listening, listening efforts? So AI has revolutionized the way we extract insights and analyze uh, data in various fields. There's a tremendous value to be unlocked from social media in the healthcare space. However, the problem is that of scale. The sheer number of discussions makes it impossible to objectively uh, analyze and measure um, and extract uh, insights from, from data. There's also variance. There's a lot of variability in terms of uh, the types of content and accounts, and it's dif really difficult to manually codify um, identification methods. And finally, incompleteness and quality of the data. And this is where AI shines, and I'm going to, I'm going to present this through an example at, on the screen. So social media is quite far from being a, a perfect data source. Uh, accounts do not clearly identify themselves uh, as patients or doctors. Uh, even the message content can sometimes be very vague. For example, here on the screen we're seeing um, a, 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 a message that was tweeted by a doctor uh, in the breast cancer space. Um, and they and they found that that uh, you know best can you know key opinion leaders in a high healthcare profession use a very short form way of communicating. So the tweet that you're seeing on the left hand side was the actual message that was sent, and it's incredibly difficult to infer what what they're saying through that little tweet. So they've developed healthcare professions have developed a shorthand way of communicating on Twitter. Um, so we had an AI break it down. And as on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that uh, the AI is very correctly sort of um, um, and sort of you know uh, summarize the the what the discussion is about. So the discussion is about a comparison between a combination of two drugs drugs uh, compared to placebo, and in one tweet in 20, 280 characters, the doctors has communicated. That the AI, that the um, the efficacy, that the tweet is about the efficacy. It highlights, a, you know, highly technical information, and it also suggests a substantial benefit in in terms of progression-free survival with a combination ther therapy compared to placebo. Um, it's also uh, I don't have enough space space on the screen, but it's also summarized things around um, the overall survival in the. Uh, expanded pathway altered group, and also about the mechanism of action itself. The, it, it, it emphasizes the importance of NGS, which is next generation sequencing, in identifying alterations in the pathway, specifically mentioning a higher patients of percentage of patients who had alterations uh, identified through NGS, and and it imp and it implies that. NGS played a role in selecting patients who may benefit more from the treatment. All of this was done in one small tweet, which the AI expanded. So, so this sort of is a good segue into into understanding some of the capabilities that AI can can provide in analyzing extremely large uh, uh, sources of, uh, of of data, such as social media. So, AI can offer powerful capabilities to you know, address incompleteness and quality. It can help in segmenting the online population uh, by precisely analyzing conversational styles, identifying patterns and characteristics of conversation styles for different user groups, um, allowing for ta tailored analysis and targeted interventions. Um, AI can infer motivations and behavior. 
um, uh, and by uh, motivations and behavior, provide insights into individual actions and help us understand why people engage in certain behaviors and make particular choices. Uh, AI can also infer biases in perception. Um, it, can under uh, it can identify underlining biases that influence the way information is interpreted, shared, discussed, and helping us understand these nuances uh, can help us with engaging with the, in the right way with online discourse. We're sort of aware of some of the other capabilities, such as detecting detailed emotional charges in online discussions that can also lead to uh, a far more nuanced analysis of um, you know, things like keep for patient frustrations, doctor frustrations, and we'll go into some of the examples in the context of AMR in a second. And finally, as we discovered in the study before, you can understand causal cause and effect of why information spreads in a certain way, why certain types of information spreads across networks, and this can be quite useful uh, in propagating public health initiatives. So, um, so onto our collaboration with, with the GAR Foundation. Um, we started working with the GAR Foundation quite recently, and so the results we're showing here are preliminary. But having said that, we had to identify two main questions to to answer with for, for the GAR Foundation. The first one was, can we identify topics for the GAR Foundation to spread awareness um, on so, so that they could improve engagement with the wider healthcare community? So what are the key topics that uh, are, are, you know, are, are trending and ranking so that, that the GAR Foundation should be talking about um, and this was fr from the premise of improving credibility for the GAR Foundation so that they can spread their message to a larger number of people. And, and, and the second was, can we use AI to find patient experiences with AMR uh, to evangelize through the GAR Foundation's pla patient platform, which is something that they are, they are building. Um, Patient experiences can be direct and indirect. This is a, this is a caveat to mention here. Uh, certain times patients are not aware of the fact that they might have antibiotic resistance, and this is another thing that uh, that uh, that AI can help us infer from the conversations that patients are having online. So, um, so our research started with collecting a sample set of posts from Reddit and Twitter. Um, we analyzed each of those posts for the account type. So the first step was identifying what the accounts were. As we mentioned on Reddit and Twitter, typically people don't explicitly mention that they're doctors or patients or, or different kinds of organizations, and, and this fact needs to be inferred. Um, so we understood what type of account uh, w was saying what, and then then we moved on to classifying each each post into different categories, such as research, news, diagnosis, treatment, symptoms, uh, management of the disease and unmet needs in the patient community. We then moved on to modeling each conversation um, on subtopics. For example, here we found emerging themes out of the entire da data set that we that we that we looked at uh, around doctors talking about antibiotic misuse. Um, and patient demands. So most of the population consumes antibiotics carelessly and and without uh, consulting healthcare professionals sometimes, which can which can factor to to antibiotic resistance. So there's a behavioral problem here. Furthermore, a lot of patients are stubborn and do not follow the healthcare professional's advice. This is a common theme that was being expressed by doctors. Patients also feel quite helpless. Um, Patients feel unsatisfied with their diagnosis and, and due to which they end up consuming um, antibiotics to alleviate symptoms. Patients also sometimes feel forced to consume antibiotics due to limited treatment options and this, this feeling of helplessness, the sentiment of helplessness. Um, there was also lots of trending research, uh, and I think this was sort of mentioned in the, one of the first presentations around efflux mechanisms and microbes. This is a, a massively trending uh, topic right now on social media, and uh, and there we also found certain topics around global warming and and the the correlation of bacteria resistance with increasing temperatures. Um, and awareness of these topics, the most uh, you know trending and 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 
topics could lead to organizations and public health initiatives like the GAR Foundation to, to increase their influence um, to establish credibility. We also found an interesting disease area, which was repeated quite common, UTI, uh, and, and you know, recurrent infections attributed uh, uh, in recurrent infections in UTI being attributed to AMR, and this was a, a pattern that was discussed, discovered across multiple patients. So, how is how is AI helping out here? Um, now, the 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 challenge here is is to to analyze thousands, sometimes millions of posts, and then you know recognize emerging patterns, and then summarizing these insights in in language that can be understood uh, understood by uh, by you know people who are who are consuming those insights. Um, on this slide, I've sort of mentioned a few uh, summaries that the AI generated on its own by analyzing and combining tweets and posts of a similar theme. So, you know, we spoke a little bit about challenges faced by doctors. Uh, uh, some more insights were that, the, that doctors mentioned that uh, being overworked and fatigued uh, contributed to an uptick in resistance because um, healthcare workers prescribe antibiotics to patient uh, to desperate patients. Um, this was a very interesting insight uh, that we learned from the data. We also learned that helplessness in patients, um, you know, patients feel frustrated and helpless, and, and, and the reasons for that were that the symptoms kept pers persisting despite receiving multiple rounds of antibiotics, um, and so on. And, 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 and a really interesting category of posts started emerging, which was around patients perhaps not being aware of, of antibiotic resistance, and, and you know, uh, this this sort of analysis can then be perhaps uh, you know expanded in the future, uh, where we can infer a potential possibility of antibiotic resistance uh, in patients communicating about uh, recurrent diseases or, or or you know the symptoms not being alleviated and, uh, and so on. All right, so um, so so this is the uh, you know. Uh, uh, our, our sort of conclusion right now with the with, with where we're at with the with the research, but we we want to continue to make uh, make more progress with the Gar Foundation in understanding and extracting and deriving insights that can help them reach uh, reach out to more individuals, establish credibility in the space, and we we're enabling this research through the Innate platform, which is the uh, the company that we we founded, uh, and Innate, the Innate platform is 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 um, essentially a a data sort of collection and and combination platform, so it sort of helps automate a lot of the work that that goes into creating insights out of data. Um, the platform combines data from various on online sources, enriches the data, uh, classifies, categorizes different accounts, posts, etc. Um, uh, you know, from from various data sources, uh, public, online, social media sources, and proprietary data sources as well. Um, it can it can then um, use a combination of artif AI, artificial intelligence uh, with custom fine tuned model to to do different types of insights and also collaborate with human experts in the loop and, and this is quite essential to make sure that um, uh, that there is a, a, a semi driving of of the AI insights by human experts as well um, who who can sort of qualitatively understand the insights um, a combination of this can lead to different types of inside reports, uh, which is what the innate platform enables, such as patient insights, HC, HCP opinion mapping, pa patient pathway mapping, um, Congress insights, insights on the different types of events that have been having happening uh, around the world, and people talking about these events on social media. And of course, key, key opinion leader identification and engagement um, is, is a key area that, that innate can help with. Um, all right, so that was a that was a quick summary of of how AI can be can be used and leveraged um, across social media networks uh, to 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 raise awareness for for public health initiatives and also be used as a mechanism to drive um, uh, positive health behavior uh, positive health behavior influence positive health behavior uh, across different types of therapeutic areas and initiatives. Um, Please get in touch if, if you found any of this to resonate. Uh, we're happy to work on more collaborations and projects uh, and, and, and really applaud the antibiotic resistance for, for the great efforts in this space. And Terco Health Hub as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil.
so we'll move swiftly to the next speaker, uh, and that is Sam from Solo. So I'll let you just introduce. Some water first. Yes, go ahead. And in the meantime, I'll see if I can get rid of this Zoom thing. Mm, no, it's going to be here still. Mm. All righty. So, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, all right. Um, can people see me through that, I guess? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I actually saw some familiar faces in the, in the back, at least. I don't know if uh, Windy is there, Auntie is there. Hello, hi, nice to see you. Um, so I'm Sam, uh, one of the co-founders and uh, CEO of, of Solo. Um, we're a Finnish, Finnish startup. We started um, officially or incorporated about in January of this year. Uh, we've been working on this for since September of uh, last year. Um, Solo is, uh, is a company um, where we're combating antibiotic resistance by building the world's most extensive uh, bacterial DNA library. And most extensive meaning uh, fastest, uh, easiest to use, and also smartest. How do I go to the... So um, there's been really good chats about uh, resistance and mechanisms. And by the way, like thanks for everybody else for... Uh, the, the talks, uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, I want to tell a little bit about how we got started. So um, I started medical school about one year ago, or one and a half years ago, um, right here. Um, before that, I did a bachelor's degree in, in uh, computer science at Alta University, um, did a few entrepreneurship uh, society things at Alta ES. So we started Kiwas Accelerator in 2017, where we raised about half a million um, funding for that and still operational, still doing really well. And since then, been kind of wanting to do a company, uh, but at the same time, I want to be a, to be a doctor, so ended up uh, going to medical school. And uh, well, now medical school is going very, very horribly. Uh, it is not progressing whatsoever, um, but um, Solo is, is definitely progressing. Um, that's fine. So kind of stating that um, starting a company while dropping med school was definitely not the turn I was expecting for myself. Um, so what ended, ended up happening was um, in April 2022, uh, last year, a um, little bit over a year ago, I went to this event very much similar to this one um, at uh, Science Corner, I think, the um, Helsinki University uh, building, and there was uh, an event about antibiotic resistance. Um, there was a few professors talking, like Marko Verta from University of Helsinki um, there, and uh, got really interested about the topic. So I uh, realized that this would have a huge impact on the economy and society in general, and, and really wanted to, to be doing at least something about it. I felt like that, hey, like with these connections I've had from Alto ES and kind of understanding that uh, how uh, startups uh, can be started, um, I could actually contribute into into the problem. Um, well, not into the problem, but solving the problem. And um, so I started exploring the, the topic a little bit, and I actually called Marco uh, the, the very next day, and he, he said that, uh, hey, you can just come talk to me uh, at the campus. And, and I went and we talked about uh, DNA sequencing coming up. Uh, so it's this kind of, like already mentioned by Manuel, in the presentation, um, that it's this kind of new emerging field. It's growing really rapidly. Um, and um, yeah, it was a very, very exciting kind of uh, to be talking about it. And then from there on, I started uh, assembling a team. I realized that sequencing could be actually used to predict antibiotic resistance. Uh, the diagnostic methods of this day are kind of outdated. Um, and also, the sequencing data is not really being utilized that well. Hello. Um, yes, go ahead. Okay, does it work? Yeah, it should be working now. All right. So yeah, a few months roll by. Um, I actually spend uh, the fall in, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and we end up uh, starting a team with uh, these two wonderful people um, that I, I get to work with these days. So Timo 
on the right is our, our tech uh, founder. Um, he worked at Upright Project previously and OPA as well. Uh, he was a data scientist there at both places. And Kerko on the left, um, he was, used to work at uh, PCG and, and Vault uh, as a designer. And me previously, like I mentioned, at Alto ES, and I also worked at Emeru Health um, for three and a half years, um, doing clinical research and product development and, and so forth. Um, and there, are, I think there's kind of a parallel between Meru starting in 2016 with mental health and, and antibiotic resistance right now. So in 2016, mental health companies were kind of this very not cool companies. There were not a lot of them, but uh, uh, Meru was one of the first ones to get kind of started. And, um, and well, they're really doing well. And I'm kind of looking at uh, the field right now of antibiotic resistance, there's not that many companies at the moment. Um, there's definitely a lot of them needed. Um, not a lot of people needed to be solving the problem. But um, yeah, so there's uh, an interesting parallel there. But OK, so we s oh, this doesn't work. There we go. Oh, something has happened to the slides when I sent them here. Um, so yeah, um, we start working as a team, and we kind of start to think about what to what to uh, pull out and what kind of a product would be relevant for the market. And these four numbers kind of uh, summarize what we what we started working with. So we all know resistant infections growing at uh, this uh, kind of dangerous uh, dangerous rate, uh, but also the the bacterial genome sequencing growth has been about thirty nine percent. For the past six or seven years, um, at the same time, like looking at it from an AI perspective, this kind of a phenotypic prediction accuracy is is very low. Well, eighty three, you could say that's quite good, but it's actually very, really, really bad if you're talking about it from a, like a diagnostics point of view. And at the same time, if you're ac actually analyzing the whole genome samples by a bioinformatician, it's about like one hour per sample. If you're taking in, into account by all the overhead. Uh, time that you're actually spending uh, per, per sample. And also kind of megatrends wise in bacterial genomics, if we're looking at the amount of sequences. So like I already mentioned, public whole genome sequences over time growing at a rapid rate. Also the cost of sequencing is, is going down. What we're actually doing is um, when the labs and the clinical labs have sequencing devices, um, they get this raw data from them. For example, here is a, an example device. I'm not going to say the name of the manufacturer. Uh, you might recognize it. Um, and um, this data is actually pretty hard to analyze. And what we're basically doing is we're helping them um, get to four uh, different outcomes, depending on the, the partner that we're working with. So it could be infectious disease insights, it could be outbreak monitoring, epidemic prevention, data for RNA or antibiotic drug development, or this kind of a super bug intel if new threats are actually emerging from, uh, from, the, from uh, existing kind of bacterial um, families uh, or populations going in the, in the uh, general population. And the product is a, is a software pro product uh, platform, um, looks a little bit like this. Um, and the core features are like super simple, so three minutes to results, whereas like currently it takes like, like I mentioned, about one hour by the buyer from Titian if they're working on, on manual samples. We can assemble the genome, um, so kind of putting together all the, the little pieces of, of the genome coming uh, from the sequencing device, we can identify the species, uh, give some predictions of the antimicrobial resistance. And the two last ones, virulen virulence factors and plasmids, I'm actually lying there a little bit because they're not like 100% uh, certain that we're able to give those, but we're working on those really, really hard at the moment. And um, the users um, use the product in a way that they um, this is the dashboard, and they actually just um, add new samples as they come out from the, the sequencing device in raw format. And it takes them three minutes to get to the results of, of those uh, raw uh, sequencing devices or data. And what do we really believe that we're best at? So like I mentioned, um, 
it's super fast. So like solo three minutes in analysis equals about 60 minutes of, of bioinformatics workload. It's like this really simple. So it's just a drag and drop with, with our product where um, if we're working with uh, a manual setup or a semi-manual setup, you have to kind of do all these things uh, separately, whereas with our product, you're able to actually do the whole thing in one pipeline. And then another one is um, being um, ease of use. So uh, while we've been talking to a lot of doctors, um, the main thing for them is why they don't use sequencing data that much yet is they just don't have an easy tool to actually be using the data for. Um, so they usually always need to consult uh, an outside party. Um, they can't just open up a browser and just drag and drop um, a sequencing file and get to the results. And, and basically, this is actually what the, the real results from our software actually looks like. So you have like a, um, a bacteria there um, overview. So species is for this one is Pseudomonas. So there's nine AMR genes. There's a few lists of uh, which genes are found. Um, some predictions of, of um, resistances, what those genes might be actually uh, uh, causing. And then um, what we're super excited about is being able to use um, pretty deep AI to predict uh, the phenotype um, with quite good accuracies. And I put only two ones because I, I really wanted to be this, uh, this to be a sneak peek because this is kind of our IP, still what we're working on. Um, so um, just being able to actually um, look at the data of the assembled genome and based on that, um, give the doctor insights on what antibiotic actually works. So for example, for this uh, um, um, sample, tobramycin is, is S, so susceptible. So you could actually use that for treatment or uh, Cipro as well. And yeah, so forth. Um, We've been working with really great partners. So I actually came back uh, two weeks ago from uh, California, from Stanford. So we're working with two labs there. Um, we've also done a few pilots with uh, University of Helsinki, working with um, University of Hamburg at the moment, also smaller pilots with uh, PHL, Finnish Institute of Health, uh, HUS, and, and FEM Lab as well, which have been really, really great. And some like outside applications were also thinking about um, this kind of tracking of chains of uh, transmissions. Um, so if, if you're doing kind of like social media, looking how the information is flowing, it's also like super relevant to actually looking at uh, how the bacteria are affecting one another, how is the plasmids uh, transferring from one bacteria to another, um, how is the resistance spreading through, through for example, those methods. And some other ones, like mentioned, antibiotic resistance detection, monitoring outbreaks, and dangerous genes. If uh, like a new, more dangerous gene is actually becoming more prevalent, we can predict that and tell the doctors that, hey, this is kind of coming up, um, and it's, uh, you should get prepared. And of course, usually the bioinformaticians or the doctors, or if it's a research group, they probably want to continue the analysis on their own. And um, we're able to actually export the data in, in our software to uh, a usable format like JSON, CSV, or PDF. And yeah, kind of like 10 year, year vision for us, uh, what we want to be, or where do we want to be in 10 years? So kind of going from zero to one in accurate phenotypic prediction. Um, second one being uh, the global leader in pathogen DNA library. Uh, not just bacterial ones, uh, and of course, enabling the future of medical development and epidemic prevention. So that's definitely required for, for this field. Cool. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I guess questions are after or at some point. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, go ahead. So, uh, in um, uh, my talk, I will try to focus uh, on uh, 
uh, what um, uh, what uh, what is experience uh, using uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, in uh, pediatrics starting from uh, one issue that is uh, uh, quite interesting that is uh, uh, represented by uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, telemedicine uh, and the fact that uh, using telemedicine uh, it is uh, uh, possible uh, to um, at the end to improve uh, the uh, possibility to uh, manage also uh, current infections and to avoid antibiotic misuse. I will uh, present three exp examples, the COVID management, the cystic fibrosis uh, management, uh, and uh, the antimicrobial stewardship in the hospitals and in primary care. In Italy, we have recently published three manuscripts on the use of telemedicine uh, for healthcare system in pediatric assistance, uh, focusing on uh, the territorial level, uh, the chronic diseases, uh, and uh, also focusing on uh, the need of information and training for pediatricians and parents in order to reduce uh, medical device. And uh, we highlighted that using telemedicine, it will be possible to put together several data, uh, also uh, with uh, clear indications uh, on conditions uh, for which the in-person examination is needed. At the moment, we have recommended in-person ex examination uh, in patients, uh, in all the patients aged below three months uh, with fever or with diarrhea or with pallor reported by parents. Uh, and uh, in case of patients of any age uh, with uh, uh, respiratory distress uh, or with uh, underlying disease uh, uh, that is not compensated uh, or with calf uh, for uh, uh, more than uh, uh, seven days. So uh, what uh, uh, we can uh, say in uh, chronic diseases uh, is that there are some conditions uh, uh, where uh, antibiotics are pre frequently prescribed uh, that uh, can uh, uh, at the end show a negative outcome uh, without uh, an appropriate monitoring. And in our opinion, the use of telemedicine in these cases can permit uh, with the artificial intelligence uh, to highlight uh, the uh, most uh, important uh, issues and also to uh, move forward uh, with an appropriate antimicrobial prescriptions. Uh, regarding COVID, uh, we uh, presented our experience in COVID management uh, using telemedicine. We were able to avoid antibiotic use and also to identify some uh, uh, viral infections that were concomitant to the first wave of COVID circulation. And there are several experiences. The first one was done in Mayo Clinic in the US, uh, where uh, artificial intelligence was used for, for COVID-19 diagnosis, especially looking at chest radiograph. So uh, this is an example uh, that shows very well how uh, the use of telemedicine together with artificial intelligence uh, can uh, improve uh, the uh, possibility uh, to, appropriate manage, uh, to the appropriate management of a viral infection. Uh, regarding cystic fibrosis, uh, I identified this example because uh, in Parma we have one of the Italian centers for cystic fibrosis uh, and uh, uh, the uh, digital technology uh, is very useful for home monitoring uh, and also to evaluate the adherence uh, to uh, the, uh, thera the different therapies in these patients. Uh, uh, we started with uh, a survey uh, among our patients uh, and uh, they declared that, that uh, they uh, were uh, quite happy, at least 60% of them, uh, with the, the possibility to perform pulmonary function testing uh, at home uh, and uh, also to uh, perform uh, telehealth visits in order to reduce the number of visits at the reference center. On the other hand, these patients usually were visited every three months, but uh, uh, the average time they spent on treatments uh, is huge because it is uh, 137 minutes per day in uh, a pediatric age and uh, 150 minutes in adults. So the possibility now that there are new therapies that has permitted uh, to, um, at the end, change completely the survival of these patients, uh, the use of telemedicine can permit uh, 
uh, a strong monitoring, uh, looking also at the adherence uh, of the prescribed therapies. Uh, it can permit to improve physical exercise, uh, to improve the early access uh, to care, uh, and uh, also to uh, improve uh, education of the patients. Now there are also wearable technologies in addition to spirometry and uh, also in addition to uh, the uh, possibility to monitor uh, oxygen saturation. And uh, with uh, this wearable, it is also pos possible to monitor uh, uh, the treatment adherence. Uh, uh, we have examples of patients uh, where uh, the uh, adherence to inhalatory treatment uh, is very well documented. Uh, and when uh, the treatment was not uh, administered or it was administered for a few minutes instead of uh, uh, the uh, therapies of uh, five minutes, uh, at the end, uh, uh, these approaches permit to show a red uh, circle that uh, represents a poor adherence. So uh, what uh, we can say is that uh, putting together telemedicine and artificial intelligence, it is possible to improve the care uh, in these patients. And also in uh, uh, also for uh, uh, radiologic evaluations in these patients, now we are working with telemedicine to improve the diagnosis of Aspergillus infection. You know that Aspergillus infection is quite complicated to be diagnosed because uh, it can uh, be just an hyper sensitivity, or it can be an infection to be treated very early in order to condition a positive outcome. Uh, excuse and, me, uh, uh, Susanna. Uh, uh, yes? Uh, we should probably wrap it up in several minutes because we're off the schedule. So if you think you could squeeze in like in five minutes... Yes, 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 yes. I will uh, uh, finish very shortly. All right, thank uh, you. So in the case of Aspergillus, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, for sure important uh, to uh, use uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, in uh, uh, the uh, radiologic follow-up of these patients. Uh, on the contrary, in the general population, I think that uh, uh, artificial intelligence will be useful uh, in the antimicrobial stewardship programs because uh, it can permit uh, to monitor prescriptions in relation to guidelines uh, and uh, also to uh, improve uh, the approach, uh, even considering results, for example, of rapid diagnostic tests. In addition, uh, uh, the key role uh, of artificial intelligence uh, uh, is uh, in uh, the uh, improvement of the quality of care uh, uh, and the prevention of the emergence of resistance uh, in patients uh, hospitalized uh, in uh, uh, low-income countries. Uh, moreover, uh, we think that uh, even uh, uh, in the approach to parents, uh, the possibility to use artificial intelligence can permit to monitor uh, the antimicrobial prescriptions, uh, looking at the appropriate disease management and even with education for caregivers on when antibiotics are recommended. Uh, there is a, a, an important experience that has been done in California together with the, uh, a China group, and uh, in this experience, it was uh, observed that uh, the uh, use of artificial intelligence can permit to identify uh, lower or upper respiratory tract infections that uh, require antibiotics. So, uh, in, in for concluding my presentation, I, I think that uh, artificial intelligence can be extremely useful in pediatrics uh, for the management of common infections, but also for the management of complicated infections in patients with chronic diseases. More Moreover, the possibility to, uh, at the end, develop new antimicrobial peptides or uh, uh, to discover new antibiotics is another very attractive approach. And I'm really sure that in the future we will have uh, further data, even in the pediatric population, on this kind uh, of uh, opportunities. Thank you very much. After quite a bit of difficulty, we finally were able to hear your presentation. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for bearing with us and being patient with all the difficulties. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and really appreciate. Hope to see you again at other health talks. Thank you.